everyone. Good evening. Uh, my name is Vanessa Sage. I am the assistant curator at the Figgy Art Museum. Uh, thank you for joining us for tonight's program featuring a talk on Lila Cabot Perry and American Women Impressionists by Dr. Amanda Burden. Uh, this talk is in conjunction with John Leslie Brack, American Impressionist, which will be on view in the third floor gallery until August 28th. Um, so, you know, next week's program is for the exhibition Anne Lindbergh, Think Like the River, and that will feature uh, River Action and the Native American Coalition, and they will be discussing the history of the Mississippi River that begins at 6.30 p.m. And uh, we are able to offer these Thursday night programs at no cost to you, thanks to the generous sponsorship of Chris and Mary Rayburn. Chris and Mary, thank you. And while these programs are free, I encourage you to become members at the museum. Your support is vital uh, now more than ever, and membership generates revenue needed to support exhibitions, educational programs, care of the collection, and much more. And now a bit more background on our speaker. Uh, Dr. Burden is a specialist in American art and a senior curator at the Brandywine River Museum of Art in Chad's Ford, Pennsylvania, uh, where she has organized many exhibitions on the fine and decorative arts of the United States. Her interest in transatlantic influences on American art informed many recent exhibitions and projects, including from 2021, America's Impressionism, Echoes of the Revolution. She joined the staff in 2012 and previously worked in the depart curatorial departments at the Florence Griswold Museum, the Philadelphia Museum of Art, and the Rhode Island School of Design Museum of Art. She earned her master's degree and PhD at Brown University, writing a dissertation on the role of women artists in the formation of America's cultural identity. After the talk, there will be time for a brief Q&A. So as Dr. Burden is speaking, please keep those questions in mind for the end. And now please join me in giving a warm welcome to our speaker this evening. Well, thank you all and um, welcome to um, uh, this evening's presentation. I'm so very pleased to be here with you to talk about my favorite thing, American art, and my very favorite aspect, women artists in American art. Um, it's been a subject I've been studying for, I did the math today, 30 years. Um, so um, uh, if I have more than uh, I should be talking about, more if I have more side stories than I should, please forgive me. Um, I'm very passionate about this subject. And so being invited here to talk about Lila Cabot Perry, I of course said yes immediately. So thanks to Vanessa for inviting me and it's been a lovely trip this far. Um, tonight, I have many intersections to discuss with you. Um, it's one of the things that I feel is interesting about American art because we're not just talking about the art, we're talking about everything else that's going on that informs the art. So my first intersection, we're backing up a little bit. We're going to talk about uh, Americans and Impressionism and why in the world um, Americans started doing Impressionism, uh, what appealed to them about it, and how did they change that style, which is predominantly French, to make it American. So that's our first step in understanding American women artists in this period. So we'll be seeing as we go through some of the things that are a little bit different about American art, but I can't not tell you about sort of the origin story of Impressionism. Um, even though Impressionism is beginning to be thought of as a global movement these days. So people are interested in American Impressionism or Canadian Impressionism or Japanese Impressionism. Um, it is it's primarily a French 19th century movement. That's its origin. And this painting that you see right here, Monet's Impression Sunrise from 1872, is played a key part in this story of the rise of Impressionism, because this is the painting where the style gets its name. A group of modern artists, uh, youngsters who were kind of rejecting the strict tradition of the academic salons and wanting to um, break free of these traditions, organized for themselves a group show of 
not using the word in, impressionist, but independent uh, artists um, in 1874 in Paris. This painting was displayed there and a critic thinking he's pretty funny said, you know, I don't really see much here. I get the impression of a lot of things here, but nothing's finished. Um, and this painting is where the critic took that, that comment from it and, and the rest went sort of down in history because French Impressionism and Claude Monet go hand in hand as we're gonna talk about later tonight. Those exhibitions took place almost every year between 1874 and 1886. So it's kind of a discrete time period in France when Impressionists were active. And then after that, they were kind of breaking up, going on to new styles. New artists were coming with the post-Impressionist styles with you know, things coming down the pike, which would be Cubism and Fauvism and all the French modernist styles. I'm bringing you this image, which is not French. Um, uh, it's the American artist Winslow Homer to, to remind us what's going on in American painting around the time that French Impressionism is rising. Um, Americans had by the 1860s staked their artistic national identity, how they would be known to the rest of the world on landscape painting. And even though Winslow Homer is not a landscape painter, I brought you this because he is observing how popular painting out in the landscape is in 1868. It's a style of painting called en plein air, out in the open air, which was a prime tenet of Monet's kind of impressionism. You go out, you sit before your motif, you let the sun, sunlight do its effect on your eyes and you capture what you see. The Americans had been working in landscape painting since much earlier in the 19th century. The Hudson River School was the first great recognized national school that was exhibiting abroad, maybe not to great fanfare, but people said, oh, that's what the Americans do. They paint those multicolored autumn leaves and the, the great Rocky Mountains that they have. And so landscape be became a key. So as we move forward, we know that um, these artists who were going to France and would become our French, our American Impressionists were already primed by being part of a tradition that was getting old and artists were looking to reject and rebel from. And they were coming from a country that really prized and valued landscape painting. So when we talk about how Americans made impression, their impression their own, it is by painting many landscapes. There are other topics, other subjects, but I'm showing you here Claude Monet and Theodore Earl Butler. And I realized today as I was walking through the exhibition, I should obviously have put a John Leslie Breck here. The problem with American Impressionism historically is that past historians, not us today, of course, but past historians have been really critical of it. Even present day critics when it was happening were critical of it because it's easy to see, you know, uh, is he just copying what Monet is doing? That's not very original. That's not something to be proud of. That's not something to call American. Um, as a matter of fact, one of the critics of the moment said um, that this period in American art made minor copyists of us all. Um, so historically speaking, this was like somewhat you know, not ashamed, but it was like not the proudest moment to show artists just very clearly copying what they're seeing French artists do. So I'm showing you here Child Hasseman, Edgar Degas. Degas known usually for his ballet dancers, but he did lots of horse racing pictures as well. Um, these are very similar in time period and shows how a young artist like Child Hassam coming to France and excited to learn new styles jumps right on this impressionist bandwagon and says, I can do something like that. I can go to the horse races and, and, and paint something like that. Um, and, it, and it's almost to be expected because the academic system, the art education system that was in place was based on copying. You copy your master, you learn from your master, you do what your master does. Now that's a little backwards for impressionism, which is very independent and subjective and make about making your mark. But we can cut our American Impressionists a little slack because that's how they learn best by imitation. 
I'm showing you here the problem with transferring a French style to the United States. Sometimes it was a matter of taking Paris's rainy day and making it Boston's rainy day. And this did not sit so well with those critics who said there's, there's nothing here of substance. That transfer that needed to happen, that was about to happen yet, was about making something American out of it, finding a niche, finding what American audiences would accept at that time. So we can see there's a little originality problem early on. Um, let me show you here, maybe the, the saving grace of, of American Impressionism. When our artists, our young artists decided not just to start following everyone, Degas and Monet and Renoir and Manet and all the Impressionists, but to really focus on one man's vision of Impressionism, Claude Monet. And you'll notice that these are photographs by Lila Cabot Perry. I know you have photographs by her daughter, Margaret, in the show, so I thought I'd show you um, Lila Cabot Perry's photos as I talk to you about what Monet did that was really appealing to not just American students, but American collectors as well. So this one artist um, had moved from Paris to Giverny, this French village um, about 40 miles from Paris um, up the Seine, um, or down the Seine technically. And um, he had kind of secluded himself there in Giverny in the early 1880s. And in fact, the house he was living in was rented until he had enough sales to American patrons to buy it outright. Um, so Monet and the Impressionists, or Monet and the Americans, was kind of a complicated codependence. He really needed them in some ways, even though he never taught any Impressionists. He didn't take students, but he befriended them. He um, gave them advice. He um, showed them his paintings. He invited them to to his home. So um, Monet in his um, sort of later years here turned to painting a kind of impressionism that focused on the rural landscape that had no politics involved in it. There were no nudes. That is very important for the American audience. No naked ladies running around these paintings at all, which was very problematic for American collectors. And, um, and it was kind of a it was a pleasant style, a calming style, a soothing style. And post-Civil War Americans were not looking for conflict and controversy in the works of art they were beginning to collect. They were looking for relaxation and peace and Monet's paintings provided this. So he, he's living there and about the mid 1880s, the Americans start showing up. Um, and here's one of the very earliest examples of an American coming to Giverny. Um, the painting on the left is Claude Monet's view of poppy fields in Giverny of 1885. The painting on the right is by Willard Metcalf, an American who actually visited Giverny in 1886, like kind of a lone visitor. Um, and you can tell there's definitely influence going on here. It's as if he saw this painting and he did meet Monet uh, and, and paint on Monet's, in Monet's garden, as a matter of fact. And he was eagerly watching to see what Monet is doing. I, um, he even wrote on the back of the painting, Maison de Claude Monet, Giverny, looking across from the end of my garden. So he rented the house next door. And you can see it's just a little slightly different view of, and I'm gonna probably turn this off. Uh, this house here, Monet's house is over here. Um, and this is a tiny painting in real life. So you can get a little closer, but let me point out to you up here, right there on the hillside, there's a little fleck of white and a figure. And I am convinced that is Monet painting on a canvas up there. So that's just how close these these Americans were kind of edging up and looking over his shoulder. Now, our second set of intersections I wanna to talk to you about is women and Impressionism. Because if we ask why would an American be interested in Impressionism, we certainly have to ask why would women be interested in Impressionism? And it really provided um, an entree, a doorway that they could go through 
that had been closed to them for so long in the academic art world. So American women around the time of the Civil War and after the Civil War, just like American men, gravitated to Paris. There are many reasons for this. Books and dissertations have been written upon this. Um, and what's interesting is that the American women traveled with the American men. When I did a statistical analysis of the 1870s and 80s um, salon exhibitions by Americans, the number of paintings that were accepted to the salon, uh, about 20% of them by, were by women, which doesn't sound like a lot by our standards today, but that is far greater than the women of any other country. Uh, so the American women in particular were very interested in getting their art education in France and doing what the men of the country were doing. So <clears throat> a painting like this upstairs in your gallery I'm sure it surprised a lot of people when they first saw it because they think, who's that? And you know, you read the label and you find out that Monet is in the background. Monet is not the one doing the painting here. That's his stepdaughter, Alice. And so I think this just kind of jars people into realizing that there were women artists at this time. And I know I can tell you that I myself didn't really expect to find women artists when I started doing research on Americans uh, working abroad. Most people believe that women didn't have or didn't even attempt or want careers in art. But as I started doing my research on what became American women in France, um, I was looking through these salon books, the re recordings of all of the people who exhibited in the French annual exhibitions, this government run um, exhibition, and I expected to see Mary Cassatt's name. And in fact, I didn't. I saw the name Mary Stevenson, and I saw a whole bunch of other women that I'd never heard of. Um, it's because Mary Cassatt didn't use her real name. She used her mother's maiden name. She didn't want to embarrass the family when she first exhibited the salon. So she went under this kind of name to avoid notoriety just in case. So even someone as famous as Mary Cassatt, you know, as, as competent as Mary Cassatt, had this idea that she needed to protect her identity, her reputation, her family's identity. And of course there were American, excuse me, there were women French Impressionists. This is Bert Morceau. And this is a painting that hung in that very first Impressionist exhibition. So right there with the men in Impressionism were at least a few women. And I've mentioned Mary Cassatt already, so I better show you some of hers. She is not only a woman Impressionist, but the only American member of the French Impressionist group. She began exhibiting at Degas' invitation um, in, let's see, 1878, I think. You'd think I'd have it written down here. Um, and 1879 at Degas' invitation, I mean, uh, she is doing a lot of paintings, as you see here, the, the image on the right, of course, is new to your gallery from the Jocelyn. I took a thousand pictures of it today because I'd never seen it in person. Um, and these are both paintings of Mary Cassatt's sister, Lydia. And you start to get the sense, even from just these two paintings, that what men painted and what women painted was not always the same thing, although landscape became a great equalizer. Um, if there were figures involved or social settings involved, there was different arenas that women had access to and men had access to. Women taking care of babies versus singing and dancing in a, a cafe concert in Paris. Um, so right away we see our first female French Impressionist has this bent to her work that makes it slightly different in subject matter. Here's a few images by Edgar Degas that I'd like to show you, because to me, it's not really, I don't wanna talk about his technique or his you know, use of Japanese prints or his pastel work. I wanna look at these more as a piece of evidence of what a French artist saw when he saw an American woman gaining traction in the French art world. So this is a portrait or a series he did um, of Mary Cassatt in the Louvre, and that's her sister Lydia. Now I'll let you guess which one's Mary Cassatt. 
Um, she is the one walking around the Louvre, the literal belly of the French cultural beast, and has this kind of, you know, regard for the things that are on the walls. Meanwhile, her sister is tucked behind, you know, a guidebook, having someone else tell her what she should be seeing and understanding. And Mary Cassatt, this kind of rakish figure that she's like, hmm, judgmental, I think, when I see this. So there's a second, there is another version here called A Visit to a Museum, uh, Museum of Fine Arts Boston, from this Louvre series. And notice that's 1879, the same year Degas invites Cassatt to exhibit with the Impressionists. What's happened now is she's turned her face towards us and we kind of get what we thought of the expression, huh, looking down her nose, hmm. But now the woman with her, Lydia, is looking at the artwork too. Now she is following the lead of her sister. And to me, this is such a metaphor for what happens when Mary Cassatt joins with the American, or joins with the Impressionists. She starts to get a little notice. People see her as a role model. Women especially see her as a role model. So I wanna show you one other Mary Cassatt. It's a favorite of mine. Not because it's of the modern style that she paints in, which is, of course, her own kind of impressionism, but because of the modern meaning behind this. This is another painting, and who knows if Mary Cassatt had this in mind. I've read the letters. She doesn't mention it um, when she made this painting, but this is, again, her sister Lydia, and this is Degas' niece, and they're riding in a carriage. As a matter of fact, she's driving, Lydia is driving, and the groom is in the back seat. And Lydia is in, in real life, when this is painted, she's learning to drive because Mary Cassatt has been successful enough in selling paintings that she's bought a horse and carriage in Paris. So I love looking at this painting. I mean, there's so much to distract you, um, but as one of these metaphors, here is a woman literally in the driver's seat. And she is, she is, demonstrating this behavior to the next generation. And if you take a look right here, the entire fulcrum of the painting, center, where all the lines point to, is the reins being held by her delicate gloved hand. And if you look really closely, it's just looped around one finger. So she's holding all of this power in her hands and she's confidently driving and demonstrating this behavior. And, and she's driving, by the way, through the Bois de Boulogne in Paris, which has not always been considered a safe space for women. Here's a couple of examples from recent art history. Uh, Gustave Courbet's Young Ladies on the Banks of the Seine from the 1850s and Manet's Déjeuner sur l'herbe um, from 1863, that scandalous painting from the French Salon that year, shows what people looking at paintings in Paris thought women did in the Bois. These are prostitutes lounging on the banks of the Seine, you know, sleeping the day away because they're busy working all night. Um, and this is Manet who has a clothing optional luncheon for a number of ladies in the Bois. So the Bois is not a safe space in in, um, uh, in social circles in France. Of course, there are ways to attend it, usually with a male chaperone, and you go to one of the balls and one of the proper nights, but you don't just drive around by yourself. So that is, um, you know, metaphorically, I know I talk about that a lot, what I think Mary Cassatt brings to the table, her, her trailblazing, if you will. Now, uh, another reason that Americans might, American women might want to go to France even more and might want to study Impressionism even more than other, um, other artists, than men or women from other countries, is explained by these two photographs. So at the left, you see, and I see these captions are a little misleading, at the left is the um, Chase School of Art Life class. That is the one with the draped figure standing on the modeling podium. And you see men and women gathered around with their sketches and their paintings and their easels. And then on the right-hand side, you see the Chase School of Art men's class and they get the nude model. And there's no ladies except the model allowed in that classroom. So this explains the difference. If you were a woman in the United States, you almost never got the chance to study the live nude. 
And it was considered a promiscuous audience if you had men and women in the same class. In fact, American artist Thomas Aikens was fired from a position at the Pennsylvania Academy for holding such a promiscuous class. Um, and so it, in a world where painting the figure and learning at schools was, was the pinnacle of, of, of art education, and you're not allowed to do that final step because you're a woman in America, you're maybe looking for a system that doesn't require you to be good at painting nudes. So here is a different Chase class. This is, when I say Chase, I mean William Merritt Chase. We'll talk about him as we go forward. This is William Merritt Chase's summer school at Shinnecock. And changing the focus from figures to landscapes makes it much more friendly to women. It makes it a much less competitive uh, situation as well because there were weekly contests at those other schools to who did the best sketch and then he, they got to sit in the front row and they got to pick the model and and you know it's all based on the French academic system which itself did not allow women um, until 1897 women were not allowed in the French Ecole de Beaux-Arts which doesn't sound so terrible I guess I mean it's to be expected but the real problem was that the Ecole was free and so the only schools that would take women were tuition-based schools. So men could go to classes for free, but women could not. So here, when we look at a new kind of classroom situation brought about by Impressionism and the kind of Impressionism that Americans liked, that plein air landscape style, it's much easier for women to rise in that system, to gain experience and to um, shake off the limitations that those other kinds of classes um, brought to you. Um, and William Merritt Chase is, is key in that. So I'm finally showing you a painting by William Merritt Chase on the left, an old early stroll in the park from 1890, along with Cecilia Bowes painting D Dorothy in the Woods from 1897. Um, and these are just to sort of help us further uh, along in the story of, of Impressionism and why women would be interested, but then what happens when women get interested in Impressionism. So we see, like I said, women joining the ranks of the Impressionists much more quickly than they could rise in the academic system. Uh, they had classes with no problems, but then there comes a criticism because there's just an inherent belief that women can't possibly do as well as men at this time period, that the criticism between Cecilia Beau and other artists at the time there's one famous quote that she was in the earnest untiring worker while, I, while her male counterpart was the, mas the mag magician of the brush. So the, there's a whole study of how women were criticized in this period and how men were criticized. Women were often belittled and said, well, it's good for a woman. Um, oh, and she, she does a, a pretty good job for a woman. Um, while well, the men get all the praise and they're magicians and masters and all sorts of things. So that is lingering in the background. You know, you, you um, cross one hurdle and then there's another one for you to accomplish. I want to show you <clears throat> one other thing, and it's not necessarily a reason why women would want to be an impressionist, but it's a consequence of women being impressionists. Impressionism becomes very mobile. So I'm showing you two paintings here, one by Julian Onderdonk and one by Emma Richardson Cherry. Julian is from Texas and Emma is from Illinois. And they both end up going to New York to study with William Merritt Chase. And then like so many others of his students, they go back to their hometowns or back across the country and they spread this impressionism around. And with William Merritt Chase so open to women artists, it means that women are involved with spreading this style across the country. And not only as artists are they working, but women in general, and this is from a long amount of study, that you know, because there's this expectation in the late 19th century that women can't really be artists. I mean, you could go to school and train, but you've got to find something different to do with your life, dearie. And so they would do things like become teachers of art or club women and founders of cultural organizations. They would write about art, be authors. So they had all these other cultural uh, roles of leadership 
And so when Emma Richardson Cherry moves back home and then she moves to Denver, she founds the uh, association that becomes the Denver Art Museum. And then when she moves to Houston, Texas, she founds the association that becomes the Museum of Fine Arts in Houston. So inviting more women into the art world really has great ripple effects throughout the country. It's one of the things I think is exciting is seeing how a style moves. So here's the meat of the matter, right? We're finally gonna get to Lila Cabot Perry, but I wanted to prime you so you knew just how amazing Perry's work is and the challenges she was facing when she, when she um, did these amazing things. So just a little introduction here. And maybe what's gonna seem like is, I'm not gonna address her paintings as much, talking about her style and what, how she places the brush and where the light is and her compositional choices. Partly this is because this is not a study that's been undertaken yet. No one's done like an in-depth analysis because we're still getting women like Lila Cabot Perry into museums and being seen by audiences. And so in fact, biography takes front and center here as I'm gonna discuss it because frankly, you know, that's fascinating, the biographical story. Um, so <clears throat> as we look at Lila Cabot Perry, and then I'm gonna show you works by three other artists at the end, I want you to pay attention to some of the patterns that are emerging here. And I think that as we begin to write these future histories, it's these patterns, the trends, the negotiations and, and the obstacles that women face that are gonna now become part of the story of American art. So just some basics here. Lila Cabot Perry was born in 1848 in Boston. Um, and she was a young woman during the Civil War. The Civil War comes up a lot in my thinking about Impressionism. And the Civil War is a time of really increased female agencies because who's running the businesses? Who's running the stores? Who's keeping the farms running? Um, women had so many more jobs that the young women in the post-Civil War era didn't wanna go back to the way things were. And so artists among them. So I'm showing you here a work you probably recognize, the untitled work from the Figgy Collection from kind of later in her career. Um, and like many young women of the period, she, uh, she sort of uh, sketching is part of her proper education, her finishing school, but no one ever expected her to make a living at it. It was just kind of a nice accomplishment as it was called to have. But her interest in art developed probably on a trip that her family took to Europe in 1867. And that's a whole other story. The World's Fair of 1867 is really important, like really important to the history of American art because it's the first time that the US exhibits at a World's Fair as a country. Every other World Fair, it was individual states. And that, that was not a message of national identity or national unity. And it was very important in the post-Civil War era in 1867 to present a united nation to the rest of the world. That's a whole different lecture. She makes her whole, uh, her very first painting in 1878. 18, when was she born? 58, 48. So if you're doing the math, She's no you know, little teenage girl here. Um, she does her first painting in 1878 and it takes until she is 36 years old for her to get her first art lessons. So um, this took a while. And what, some of the reasons are because of her social status, because it was not considered appropriate or proper, um, but also because she was a woman of privilege. There's no way around that. She came from two very prominent Boston Brahmin families, the Cabots and the Lowells. Um, and her social circle included uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson, Louisa May Alcott, uh, Henry James, her brother-in-law was the artist John Lafarge. And then she married into a really um, uh, important family as well. Her husband was Thomas Sargent Perry. They got married in 1874. He was a Harvard professor of 18th century literature, but that married her into the family of Commodore Matthew Perry. And her later trips to Japan were certainly influenced by his um, presence in her life. So she begins working, she begins taking lessons. 
Um, she decides with this life of privilege and the fact that her father dies in 1885 and leaves her an inheritance, that she wants to use that money to go to Europe to take art lessons and to see if she can become an artist. Um, now, it wasn't a huge inheritance. It didn't last her entire life, but it really made it easier to get over uh, to Europe and to begin her new life there. And in fact, her first portrait work, she was very well known for doing her portraits. Her first portrait is of her own daughter, Margaret, who has photographs in your exhibition. Um, and by the time she moves to Paris to do this, she brings three daughters with her. So she's doing all of this, not as a 20 year old fresh off, you know, fresh out of school and going to do this, but as a woman who has responsibilities and a family. Um, she very successfully submits her first painting to the Paris Salon of 1889 at the age of 41. So subtract 20 years from that, and that's more the average salon submission date for artists in that period. A couple more lovely views, and you can certainly uh, think of some of the John Leslie Brecks as we look at these. Um, she studied abroad in Paris and in other countries, but Paris was the place to study. And so as she's in France, um, she attended those academies, the ones for pay that women could attend. Um, and by the way, they of course charge twice as much for women's classes than for men's classes. Um, the women could get that academic training, but it was kind of this pay to play system. And, you know, as I mentioned, the Ecole, the free school, didn't accept women until 1897. In 1889, so before both of these, obviously, she saw her first painting by Monet and met the man. As a matter of fact, she was with her friend Cecilia Beau, who we looked at a few minutes ago. And she kind of was won over immediately by this new style. You don't have to fight the academies. You don't have to pay the fees. You don't have to be in the competitions where people just think you're automatically not as good as you're, if you're a woman. Here's a style of art that you know, circumvents all of that. So she, like many others, and I've shown you Willard Metcalf, but of course, John Leslie Breck, um, when she, has met Monet and is won over to the style, she, like so many others, goes to Giverny. Um, even if Monet is not going to take students, they can be near him and see what he's painting and sort of watch him out of the corner of their eye. So she joins this American colony, an art colony that's sprouted up in Giverny. And it's not just Americans there. There are people from all over the world, but it's predominantly Americans. As a matter of fact, if you go there today, there is, a, there is a plaque in the town that talks about the famous artists who came there, like um, Mary Cassatt, and about all the Americans who came there. So she goes to Giverny. Um, she's, remember, with her husband and her children, and she becomes friends with him. This is the great part. She becomes friends with him to the point that I think no one really understood until Monet died. And he, she wrote a beautiful reminiscence, a memorial tribute to him for an American art magazine. And in fact, what's revealed there, first of all, it's, it's so revealing of how Monet worked. Someone who was spent time with him, watched him, talked about his technique and his thoughts. But there is some oft quoted advice by Monet to other artists is usually how it's addressed in um, art history textbooks, but it was in fact, advice he gave to Lila Cabot Perry. And it is this, when you go out to paint, try to forget the objects you have before you, a tree, a house, a field, whatever. Merely think, here's a little square of blue. Here's an oblong of pink. Here, a streak of yellow and paint it just as it looks to you, the exact color and shape until it gives you your own naive impression of the scene before you. That was what he told Lila Cabot Perry to do. So the Perrys went back there nine summers in a row um, and spent time and looked over Monet's shoulder. So I showed you Willard Metcalf earlier in that poppy painting. Here's Lila Cabot Perry. So these are two friends of Monet painting something that is very like, I believe I have this as the next image, the, the photograph that Margaret Perry makes of this, um, I think it's the River Apt. Um, which runs uh, through Giverny and where Monet painted very often. So we saw those two, two works. And just as an aside, the fact that she inspired and she encouraged her daughter to 
pursue a form of art, a new modern form of art and photography, I think just speaks volumes as well. I mean, I'm talking in metaphors and similes here, but here's something, some actual evidence of encouraging that next generation. So we were talking about this before the lecture. Yes, she went to Japan. And if your uncle is um, Commodore Perry, you might think you get a bit of a royal welcome. Um, but she went because her, her husband was a professor um, and he did, took a teaching position uh, between 1898 and 1901 at a university in Tokyo. And visiting Japan set her artwork on fire. She was so prolific. She painted more than 80 works in Japan and you know, you may know um, from other art histories how important Japanese art, Japanese prints are to some of the Impressionists, Monet included. He had a huge collection of Japanese prints. And so Perry got to go to Japan and absorb this cultural aesthetic firsthand. It wasn't just in prints that got shipped to Europe. And um, the American art historian, Bill Gertz, who I have called um, the architect of American Impressionism, he is the art historian that gave it some credibility and some texture and some attention in art history. Um, he said about her, about her trip to Japan, Perry's work is the least traditional and the most indebted to the Impressionist aesthetic. And some of her Japanese scenes are in color and brushwork, extremely close to Monet. So eventually she returns to Boston. So she's living in Giverny or she's visiting Japan, but she keeps coming back to Boston and then to New Hampshire um, where she has a farm. She and her family have a farm and New Hampshire becomes her Giverny. It's a farm community, a small village uh, that she lives in and it becomes part of her American Giverny. And that's something other artists do as well. So it just in this, in this last comparison with Lila Cabot Perry, before I talk to you about a few other artists, um, this, uh, this publication of Monet's reminiscences, as I mentioned, really put her, her writings about Monet and her attention to Monet and her promotion of, it, uh, of Monet in the spotlight. So not only is she an artist who in some ways follows in Monet's footsteps, but she worked to get American audiences interested in him as well. She brought uh, the first Monet painting to Boston and she, it was not well liked, but she brought it. Um, and she encouraged her friends in these bigger social circles to see the value in this artwork and to see the value in other artists painting in this form, like John Leslie Breck. She did lectures, she did um, promotions, she had organized gallery exhibitions. She was instrumental in founding the Boston, uh, the Guild of Boston Artists in 1914. And she, she did those other things that women who couldn't be real artists did. Um, and it seems to me the women were expected to do a lot more than just be artists. They had to work very hard to promote the arts, to be teachers, to be accepting, to still raise their families in, in many cases. Um, and then she gets her own solo exhibition at the St. Bartolf's Club, which is the place where John Leslie Brett killed himself. Um, and actually the location of Monet's first exhibition in Boston as well. Uh, and that was in 1897 and the, the newspaper review said, Mrs. Perry is one of the most genuine, no nonsense, natural painters that we know of. Such paintings must be taken seriously. So the reading between the lines there is, it's kind of a defense that this newspaper critic is saying, you need to take her work seriously, you know, because the, the general public might see the name, you know, oh, it's from that family. Oh, it's a woman. Oh, she's got money and not take her seriously as an artist. Um, <clears throat> so what I'd like to do, knowing that, knowing these stories about Lila Cabot Perry, I would like to tell you about three other artists very quickly, women I think that are just as deserving as Lila Cabot Perry. And in many cases, very little is known about them. So we're still on the kind of cutting edge of adding these women to the canon. The first is named Helen M. Turner. Um, and uh, Helen is, and I'm trying to be, you know, what I found is that while art histories usually concentrate on New York City, and Boston and maybe Philadelphia. 
um, that when we look more broadly, we see much more talent in the country. Um, Turner is from uh, Louisville, Kentucky. Oh, well, she was born in Louisville to a New Orleans family. And she was born in 1858. So she's about 10 years younger than Lila Cabot Perry. But she and her family fled from the Civil War. Um, and her family business was destroyed and her mother's health was destroyed during the war. She passed away and just a few years later, her father passed away, leaving her as an orphan at age 13. She was being taken care of by an uncle and she taught herself to paint. Um, uh, you know, it sort of, again, was something that would be expected of a, a woman of a certain social class. They were sort of, um, you know, the refined poor of formerly great New Orleans family that had been ruined by the war. Um, around age 22, she starts, uh, she takes some free classes at Tulane University. And then that, that um, uncle that was her chaperone and her caretaker passes away as well. And she's completely alone and independent. And she decides that she's going to make her living through art. She moves to Dallas, Texas and starts teaching. And she earns enough from her teaching that she can go and take real art lessons, guess where, New York City, with guess who, William Merritt Chase. Um, because he is known to be so open and welcoming to women students. So he studied with, she studied with Chase and took three trips abroad with his classes. He would take his students uh, to Italy, but she never went to Giverny. She never went to France, only Italy. So we see her style here um, emerging as impressionistic. She uses those broken brushworks. Um, her style was kind of set by about 1910. Um, in the summers, she would uh, spend her, her time in an art colony in Cragsmore, New York. So um, there is that. Uh, idea again of finding a place of like-minded artists to sort of escape with, whether it's Giverny or New Hampshire or Craigsmore. She was noted at the time for painting, quote, a woman's point of view. Ordinary women doing ordinary things. Now there is a kernel of that that is impressionism, ordinary people doing ordinary things. Um, that was a big difference from academic painting who said, we'll paint generals and great historic moments and portraits of important people. Um, and landscape painting, that's the lowest of the low. Well, except for maybe still life painting, I suppose. But um, the academics um, <clears throat> um, valued different things than the impressionists did. So this ordinariness is part of Helen Turner's work. She, uh, when she was in New York between 1902 and 1919 in the, uh, in the winters when she'd be in the city, she taught at the YWCA, not a fine and fancy art school. And she didn't teach fine art oil painting. She taught applied arts, things that women could do to be useful and get paid and make a living in the arts. Um, she was noticed by Duncan Phillips. So the Phillips collection in Washington, D.C. has a number of paintings by her. And she was elected to the National Academy of Design. She was only the third woman in history to be in the National Academy and one of even fewer Southern artists. So, and I should advance this because this is the slide that's really, oh, came up perfectly. Um, uh, that Earlier today, that took a long time to load because that's like a hundred megabyte TIFF in there. <laughs> um, the second artist I wanna talk to you about is from California. Her name is Evelyn McCormick. This is a painting called A Garden in Giverny. So surprise, surprise, she went to Giverny. She was born in California, around San Francisco, raised around San Francisco and went to a private girls school where she learned uh, things like China painting. And in fact, um, she first began exhibiting at local fairs. Um, she was born in 1862. She was, she's a Civil War baby, but comes of age afterwards. She's exhibiting in fairs, but she's not doing oil painting. She's doing painted porcelain because that's acceptable and appropriate for a young woman to be doing. But then she decides she's going to go to try and train to be an artist and attends the California School of Design. And when she meets a bunch of like-minded artists there who are looking for something new, something challenging, something maybe a little rebellious, they go to Paris together and they start taking classes. Um, so uh, let's 
let's see, this is a painting that she made in Giverny in the summer of 1890. She starts taking classes at those schools that accept women students, the Academy Payants. Um, and she and some classmates over the summer decide to go visit Giverny and meet Monet. And this painting that she makes there is a turning point for her. It's a turning point in, in art as well, because this is an impressionist influence painting that was made in Giverny that was accepted at the Salon of 1891, that academic bastion of official art. So we see that the Salon, the official academic systems exhibitions are changing as well. I just love this comparison because there's pumpkins in Giverny and now here is cactuses in California. This is um, really transferring that technique to a new American subject matter. So when she returns to the US, she brings this style and what she's learned back to California and continues on as an artist, um, working mostly around San Francisco and Monterey where she helps set up an art colony. Um, this is an 1893 work and it was shown at the Chicago um, World's Fair in the Women's Pavilion. So not in the Fine Art Pavilion, but in the Women's Pavilion as Mary Cassatt's paintings were shown in the Women's Pavilion. Still in the 1890s. But um, when she brings this style back to California, she, um, she begins, uh, you know, she's promoting arts, she's being active in arts organizations, but then the San Francisco earthquake of 1906 hits and she loses her studio and most of her paintings. So she has to begin again, um, but she has by this time become involved in a lot of cultural work, establishing galleries, um, founding colonies in Laguna and Monterey and developing art associations. So she's a really important art world leader in California. Um, she even worked in the, during the depression for the WPA recording historic buildings in California. Oh, and I should mention that when William Merritt Chase came to have a school in Carmel for one season, guess who hosted him? Um, so Chase is the thread throughout all of this as well. And it just goes to show you how much someone making an attempt to be inclusive of women artists, how much of a difference that could make. The last artist I wanna to talk to you about just briefly is Elizabeth Norse. She was born in 1859 and she started as a realist painter. Now she was born around Cincinnati, Ohio. Her family um, moved to Cincinnati when she was young. And the longer that she works, the more impressionistic she gets. So she's really highly praised in her day. Her works are, um, if you read her reviews, she is well reviewed. In fact, when she, um, uh, she became, I mentioned the National Academy of Design, they have something similar in France called the Société Nationale de Beaux-Arts and she is the first American woman to be inducted into that. But, like so many in our stories, her family was ruined by the Civil War. Her father was in banking and he lost all of his money and his job. And um, she was able to attend the McMicken School in Ohio when she was 15 years old. And she did study painting and sculpture, but you know what else she studied? Uh, wood carving, china painting, engraving, all those other really useful arts because if she was going to be an artist, she needed, she felt, those skills to fall back on. She had even started her own business when she was a teenager of doing pen and ink drawings of people's houses and selling them to them. She worked in um, illustration and she designed murals. So she did everything she could. She wasn't sort of that art snob that says only commissions of fine art on canvas. Um, she really did what she could to be involved in the art world. But, <clears throat> and she was even offered a teaching position at McMicken, but she turned it down because she really wanted to focus on her art. But both of her parents died in 1882 when she's a young woman. And she has a patron who um, offers to send her for training to New York. And I don't have to tell you whose school she went to in New York. Um, William Merritt Chase got another student um, and, and you know, um, she trained with him there as this orphan um, and she returns home. And so not only is she working in Cincinnati, but she spends her summers in Tennessee and Appalachia. So she is working and spreading what she knows there as well. 
So here we have an artist, here's some of her examples, who has no family wealth, who, has no who does no teaching, who relies on her arts to support her. Um, so very different from some of the other women who had either took teaching jobs or who had family wealth to rely on. But she moved to Paris, she earned enough money and she moved to Paris in 1887. And she first begins to go to those academic schools that take women and they're like, we have nothing left to teach you. Um, she submitted a, a painting to the salon three months after she arrives and it's accepted. And um, not only is accepted, she gets this award from the French government. They buy one of her paintings, which you can still see in the Luxembourg galleries in Paris now. So she hit all of the high points um, and she did a lot of traveling, but she did not return to the US when most artists did during World War I. So it's fascinating. She was really committed to her new country. And so she was a presence in the French art world for other Americans, for other women who would seek out her advice. Uh, in 1920, she developed breast cancer and she did not paint after that. Um, the longer she stayed in Paris, you know, the, the more impressionistic she got. But after her diagnosis and her surgery, she no longer painted and she died in 1938. So the last 18 years of her life were without art. So let me just show you a couple of fantastic Lila Cabot Perrys, one in a private collection, one in the Newark Museum, which I think is in your show. Is it in your show? Maybe not in your show. I think it's in the show. Yes, it's in the show. And that view on the left-hand side of Monet's garden in Giverny, that's his little painting boat. Monet had a little painting boat that he took out on the rivers. So whether it's Mary Cassatt or Lila Cabot Perry, Helen Turner, Evelyn McCormick, or Elizabeth Norse, the American women impressionists faced the same challenges of learning and introducing a new modern style to American audiences as their male counterparts. The fact that they did it in an environment that discouraged women from being artists, from taking the same course of studies as men, and from choosing professional careers over families makes the resolve all the more remarkable. Facing a discriminatory market that firmly believed women could not accomplish works of equal merit to men, and a historical afterlife that downplayed not only their achievements, but their sheer presence as part of the changing American art world. These works, these artists we've discussed here today, deserve a much fuller recognition than they've had thus far. Until their work as artists, teachers, cultural leaders, and patrons is reconciled, we have a lot to learn about a style of art that if you've been paying attention as we go along to the dates, this style of American Impressionism lasted a very long time. It lingered, as I like to say, on American canvases. So the visual aesthetics of Impressionism combined with the social history of women in the US tells us a colorful, forward-thinking, determined and powerful story that will alter the way we think about the history of American art. At least I hope so. Thank you. <laughs>